Hi everyone, Mark DeJesus here, teaching and equipping you to help you experience healing and freedom in your journey, especially when it comes to mental, emotional, and relationship health. I wanna to talk to you today about ruminating. Now, I did a video about how I stopped ruminating. You can check that out, and that has helped a number of people. But today, what I wanna specifically get into is addressing a question about ruminating about your past. And it was actually a question that just came in during one of my Q&A lives, and I didn't get a chance to address the Super Chat question. And when I saw it after the broadcast, I said, you know what, this is a great question, and I'd like to spend some time addressing this. The question says this, it says, hi, Mark, I struggle with rumination on past upsetting events. People often tell me to just let it go. I find this to be dismissive and frustrating. Can you help me understand what they mean by that? So not only do I want to address what you're asking, I also want to address this subject about ruminating about the past and what it can invite us to experience in our healing and freedom journey. Control is an issue that affects everyone. Everyone to some degree has control issues. Some it's massive, others it, we just, we, we need to be aware of it and, and work on it nonetheless. Everybody has control issues to some extent. For obsessors who ruminate a lot, they have a very hard time practicing what we call letting go. And we say this statement, right? Just let it go. Let it go, let it go, right? And A, that's very difficult for people with OCD or trauma or anxiety issues or they're chronic worriers. And two, we often don't know what that looks like. What does it look like to effectively let go? So I'm gonna lead us on a journey towards the letting go, what that looks like, but we gotta navigate some areas first to understand. So let's talk about ruminating. And, and, and like I said, I mentioned in another video what rumination is and, and, and how I began to stop my uh, very self-destructive ruminating habits, because ruminating is not healthy. It's a toiling or spinning over a subject where we like just keep rehashing it, re-going over it with the intent that somehow we'll get to the bottom of this and figure it out. The more we get into this spin cycle, the worse it gets. So the goal is to live present. And we want to have a healthy sense of our future and have a healthy sense of our past. Ruminating takes us out of the present. It gets us lost into the future, which is worry. Worry is the fear of the future. And there's an anxiety mixed in with that, the sense of looming dread over the future, over something that's going to happen. So we spin, 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 and Jesus told us in Matthew that that's not going to add any stature. It's not going to help you at all. You need to look, go outside and look at the lilies, go out in nature and look and realize how God can bring you back into the present. You're going to be okay in the future because he's with you. But ruminating can also affect the past. And what happens with the past is there's a heavy shame influence that creates a spin cycle of shame. And this is what keeps the ruminating going. Shame and anxiety actually work together regarding the past to spin and spin and spin over certain issues. Now, they could be areas like sin issues where you could look and go, that was, that was an example of sin in my life. Could be whole varying degrees of things, of experiences, things that you did, things that happened, right? That you put in the category of saying sin. But then it even gets into a lot of areas. And this can cross over, certainly. I don't want to get lost in the weeds of defining things. But this also gets into mistakes. It gets into weaknesses. It gets into flaws and even areas of immaturity. Because in your past, many decisions and many actions and thought patterns happen because of lack of equipping, immaturity, and just where you're at in your life. So here we are in the present moment, and we are applying a heavy dose of shame to our past because those past moments are very vulnerable. They reveal the flaws. They reveal the unrenewed aspects of our journey, the difficulties, the challenge, the traumas, the dramas, right? And what I find is these, the perception can become more micro. 
And what I mean by that in this arrow is that it can have like a general thing that happened in your past. Maybe it's a divorce you went through, or maybe it was um, some bad relationship decisions that you made, some financial decisions that you made, some losses, some things that took place, broken relationships, things you said, things you didn't say. But then it starts to get more and more micro. Now you're analyzing discussions you had and you leave the discussion and now you're spinning about what you said, about what you didn't say. You feel stupid. You feel stupid for what you said. You feel stupid for what you didn't say. You replay the moment with a shame perspective. How do you know that you're replaying a moment with a shame perspective? Well, what you're doing is, one, you just kind of had that gross, like, yuck feeling, right? That's just like, ah, all right? And what you do is the narrative is putting the weight of guilt and shame back on you of all the things you did wrong, all the things you said and shouldn't have said. It doesn't give grace for your learning and your journey. It highlights you in an exposing way. And if you notice, this isn't fruitful. But we still get caught into it. Why? Because the emotions are so strong. And I've had, I've had so many moments in my history where I think back to immature decisions, immature perspectives, and I just want to run and hide from that, right? I can look back at mistakes in my life, in my journey, but it can even get more micro to one little thing I said. And I was like, oh, that was so stupid. Why did I say that? And then what happens is I start analyzing it, analyzing it, analyzing it, and the emotion of it rises to the surface, it often happens in the morning when you first wake up, you're like, oh, what I just, what happened yesterday. And people with OCD or perfectionism issues, they can often get more and more micro where they're hyper analyzing the littlest of things and the littlest of moments because shame and anxiety are taking on the dominant microphone in their life. It's not allowing them to see themselves in compassion and grace because without compassion and grace, we drown. And So anyways, it gets more micro. So what we do is we get involved in unproductive spinning. And here are some things that we get into. One is just replaying it over and over again. It's almost like very similar to trauma recall. It's like the moment comes up and it just, it keeps being triggered. It rises up. We feel this disgust, the shame. Anxiety rises up. Like I could feel it in my chest, in my neck, this moment, this heightened moment, and it just keeps replaying. And I just want it to go away. And I just want to get rid of it, right? So we think ruminating is the answer. Now we start hyper analyzing it. And what we do is we search for a fix. Let me let me fix this. Let me fix this. So we look for a cognitive argument with it, right? We try to argue, like, okay, and maybe that helps a little bit, but then it doesn't. It's still churning now. And now we're trying to fix it. So then maybe we're praying, we're repenting, we're asking God for forgiveness. And usually ruminators about their past have already prayed for forgiveness and repented a million times. And now they're frustrated because it doesn't seem to work because they're in this like fix it state. They don't realize they're in a state of trying to fix and change the past and make it totally different so that it abides by different manifestations so that now they'll feel better. And they're not realizing it's an impossible mission because you cannot change the past. But what you can do is heal in how you see the past and actually learn from it. Our past is actually there for our learning, but shame isn't going to let you learn. So you're going to replay it, then you're going to search to fix it, fix it, right? Then when that doesn't work, you just want to get it off of you. Like in the shower, you just want to shower this, maybe the dirty feelings off of you because now you have interpretations of your past that are working against you. You put these, you put these heavy condemning labels on yourself and we get into avoidance patterns, right? We run from the thought, just go away, just get out of here, right? Or many people out of shame have a don't go there. Just don't go there. Can't. And and just, we have to be aware of certain topics in our life that have a don't go there fence around it because it means that there's no access for healing. We got to allow healing in those areas. Many times, the shame response that we're, we're giving is not about fixing your past or trying to do some spiritual ritual that you've already done a thousand times to keep doing. It's more about reinterpreting how you see your past. 
Because God actually uses the full package of the good, the bad, and the ugly as a part of his redemptive work in your journey. All throughout the scriptures, from beginning to end, you see every person with major flaws, major mistakes. And they had to come to terms with those things in the process, and God still used them even in spite, even with all the brokenness and flaws and bad decisions and sins. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul. He was, on a regular basis, mentioning the areas of his life and the struggles of how to reconcile and look at things in the past. There were great victories, right, that he would want to get prideful in about, right? And he would realize all that's nothing compared to the beauty of Christ, but also had to realize his former life and realize his mistakes and learn to actually embrace those as a part of his journey. But we do a lot of avoidance. A big thing that I've done numerous times, and many people do, is this area of should. They should on themselves. There's many examples I've had. Many moments where I said something, where I asked a question, and then when I got the answer, I immediately was, oh, that was so stupid. Why did I say that? Or a sentence would come out of my mouth, and I was like, that just sounds stupid. They think I'm stupid. They probably think I'm an idiot. Why did I even do that? Or there's even more harmful moments. I, I, I told a story back when my son Maximus was very, very young and where I didn't latch the gate. I ran down the stairs to grab something. I was going to come right back up. And I didn't know that, but my son followed me, went through and fell down the stairs. It was a, it was a traumatic moment for my wife and I, a horrible moment. And for months and years, that moment would replay, and I would keep, when it was replaying, I'm searching in the past for a fix. I'd even find myself wanting to go into the past, and I'm wanting to go into a time machine, and I want to take that moment and fix it, right? That's driven by shame, because shame says, this is all your fault. It doesn't give room for learning, for growth, for mistakes. There's no grace. You got to fix that, because then I'm a terrible father, now I'm a terrible father. This is all my fault. And now I'm stuck there. And I can't let myself heal and grieve in that moment. And now it's, it's, it's branching off into all different areas. And I'm should, shooting on myself of where I should do better, where I should say better. People write to me all the time, a divorce they've had, it haunts them. And they're like, oh, or, or they've even... They've cheated, or they've, they've had some sexual sin, or they, um, they, they had a drug addiction, or, or whatever it is, or they've made some mistakes and sins in their life, and they keep replaying it and replaying it and replaying it. And what it does is it disqualifies them. They feel this issue disqualifies them, so they're constantly in avoidance. They run and hide because there's this driving abandonment issue. If people know about this, they will leave me, avoid me, reject me, abandon me, and then I'll be alone. Worse yet, we transfer that to God as if he doesn't know. And many times people struggle with, oh my goodness, uh, God has left me because my sins disqualify me. So we, I find in many people I work with, they disqualify themselves from unconditional love for all this because God loves you right now and invites you in, but they, they resist the love arrives and they find a way to disqualify themselves. They find a scripture. They find some, something that accuses them and disqualifies unconditional love. So they stay in a self-hating, self-rejecting pattern. They stay in disqualification and they have a narrative that convinces them of that. So this spin cycle can be broken free, but it's going to take a journey. And the key the key, I want you to pay attention to this before I get to the next flow of healing in this, is actually adjusting how we relate to ourselves, and this gets reflected in how we relate to our past. Part of your healing journey is learning to put your past in a gracious and compassionate perspective. Grace allows you to realize it is Christ's work, God's power working in and through your life, in your weaknesses, in all of what you've been through. God isn't just highlighting your victories. He's working in everything, and he's using everything as a part of your journey. Grace points us to the journey. Love is helping us to realize he loves us right now, not when we fix this stuff and change it. 
And that's just a beauty of what the cross brings. It brings about a forgiving heart, a compassionate heart, so that we're brought into relationship. We're changed out of relationship. But shamers in the spin cycle, they think relationship will happen once this is all cleaned up. Clean it up, then God will be, will be with you. Well, really, he'll just tolerate you. So, we'll, okay, when I clean all this up, so then it creates a self-effort. We follow the shame, listen to the shame. And really, the time and season that we're in is learning how to relate to yourself differently and how to relate to your past. These triggers of past events are actually calling for you not to go back and edit them and fix them. It's calling you to see them with renewed eyes. And that is going to take some practice. All right, so here's some things I want to walk you through a little bit when it comes to seeing our past and not in a ruminating place. Again, you also want to apply just overall principles of ruminating, some slowing down, uh, some of the things I've talked about in other resources and materials. But here, in regard to your past, it's important that you discern the just right but never enough mentality. And this helps reveal the presence of what is often called the inner critic, this is the inner voice within that's based on self-hatred. It's a lack of loving posture, more of a hateful response. It's also mixed in with fear, shame, and a self-rejection. Many people who battle with this, there is this, this ominous self-rejection theme that overrides their thoughts and perceptions about themselves. So it blocks love. So that doesn't allow you to heal. When love is being blocked and being received, we can't heal. Apart from love, we, we just continue to spin in our shame cycles. So discern the just right but never enough. That's perfectionism. That's that, that's what that inner critic fuels. is a perfectionistic mindset about your past. It says you're disqualified because of it. God says, I want to embrace all of you, including your wounded, mistaken, even sinful past. But for this influence, it has a zero tolerance for mistakes, flaws. It, it, it just, you're not loved with these things in your life. That's the overall theme. So unconditional love is actually a remedy for this. And it's practicing seeing your past through a compassionate lens. And this leads me to really this is where the rubber meets the road. When you have that that event, like this person wrote, rumination on a past upsetting event. When it rises up, it's very similar to somebody who struggles with trauma. The goal in working through trauma is we want to be able to, when the trigger happens of the moment, which you can't really control, and this is the control myth that we live in, and we can control whether or not something arises. No, it happens, it kicks your emotions up, and... What we can do is learn a new response. And the new response, this is where the rubber meets the road, is a new relationship with yourself. And really inviting God's loving, compassionate, gracious perspective to enter in. And this is going to be involved practicing a compassionate reaction. So when the memory rises up, the question you have to ask yourself is, what does it look like to see this event through absolute gracious compassionate kind of perspectives. And sometimes people don't know how to even do that. So I say, okay, think for a moment of somebody you love in your life. Who do you love the most? Those of you watching this video, think about it. Who do you love the most? Easy to love them and just pour love and compassion. A lot of times people say it's their child. They may say it's their spouse. They may say it's a friend, right? Think of that person. If that person had this passful event or the, the, I'm not passful, this shameful event that they are spinning about, that they're ashamed over, uh, this mistake, sin, whatever, whatever kind of issue, and they brought it to your attention and you're tuned into compassion over them, just really connecting to that, what would you say? What would your posture be? Now, in that place of love, you wouldn't yell at them. You wouldn't lecture them. You wouldn't tell them how terrible they are. Your first response would be maybe an embrace. It may be, I understand. A lot of people, when I walk them through their, this exercise, they say, I'm here for you. Their first response is proximity. I'm getting closer. What does shame do? It pushes 
distance. We feel God's distant from us. And what happens within? We separate from ourselves. We separate from this part of our history and therefore separate from ourselves because we're embarrassed of ourselves. What do we do when we're embarrassed, right? If somebody embarrasses you, you want to get out of there, right? Like if one of your family members or you know your, your uncle at a party or something embarrasses you, you want to get away from that person. When we're embarrassed with ourselves, this is what we do. We want to get away from ourselves. Compassion reverses it. Now I'm going to move towards you. God in our sin and struggles moves towards us. But that's frightening for many of us programmed by shame because we're like, this is uncomfortable, right? But you need to recognize this and practice. When the memory hits up, it's okay that I'm feeling this way. I did the best I could at that moment. I was immature. I didn't know. I was living out of broken places. Now, many people go, oh, you're excusing sin, Mark, right? That's the rise of the inner critic because it disrupts this moment and doesn't want healing to happen. No, when we're acting compassionately, we see it for what it is. Yep, this is what happened. But God is here. And God loves me and his grace is towards me. And I've got to learn how to have a new relationship with myself and my history. I've sat down with many people who they've had marriage mistakes, uh, drug mistakes, uh, you name it. And they want to help other people, but they feel so disqualified because of their history. And they're hiding and running from it. And what you actually need to learn is have a compassionate reaction to renew your response. And this comes down to interpretation. How are we interpreting your past? This is the report. And we have to decide whose report are we going to believe. Are we going to believe the report that keeps us stuck? Because the report of the enemy, which is shame-based, keeps you stuck in your past without movement through it so that your past gets into proper perspective right? Compassionate love meets you in it, walks you slowly through it so that your past becomes a part of your story in a fruitful way. You see it as a liability, but your past mistakes are actually an asset for your journey, providing you connect to grace and compassion in your life. It's all about interpreting. What's your interpretation? And for most people that write to me, ask questions, they interpret their journey through the inner critic. Now, it may have some factual things to it, but notice they're stuck. It's not the truth that sets us free. It's factual accusatory evidence to accuse you. And all of us have a list of thousands of things we could all be accused of, right? Compassion changes the perspective. It doesn't, you know, some people think grace is sloppy or love is sloppy. Uh-uh. It actually sees the mess, but love brings relationship connection into the mess. Grace makes it possible because of what Christ did for us to shift the environment where now love can cover a multitude of sins, where when sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Just when we think we got disqualified, God's muscles are just getting started to work in our lives. Now, the healing journey, what I just described, when I said, you know, think of a friend that you have or a loved one that you love, how would you, how would you talk to them? Give that to yourself. This is the process of reparenting. And many of you are learning how to reparent yourselves because you're still yelling at the 12-year-old version of you. You're still yelling at the 15-year-old, the 18-year-old, whatever. You're still yelling at the kid, lecturing, condemning, shaming, pushing them away when what that kid needs, that whatever stage of life you were in or young 20s or whenever in your adult life, that person needs an embrace, a hug. They need grace. They need compassion because God's love sets the environment for us to be set free. And so when you're reparenting, you're developing, number one, a new relationship with yourself. And this is what all healing is bringing about in our lives. This is what is the work of the journey. Two, you're getting a new parental perspective. And guess who your new parent is? God, your father. You're learning how to relate to a new dad who is a good father. But you're also looking in the mirror and relating to yourself in a new way. This is where we need to park. 
in our journaling, in our processing, how would you relate to that moment in your past if you were wired into compassionate grace? This will not be a light switch. There'll be a lot of days where it feels awkward. There'll be a lot of days where you're going to feel like bawling your eyes out. Go ahead and bawl your eyes out. Go ahead and let the tears flow. That's part of your grieving. There's going to be other moments where you feel just a smidge of some breakthrough. There you go. You're on to something, right? Because you're learning how to relate to yourself, your thoughts, and your history. We're not going to avoid your past. Nope. It's a part of it. So then what this can provide is an opportunity to humbly and lovingly embrace the past rather than running and hiding from it. I noticed in my parents' generation, there was a lot of people who came to Christ out of really difficult backgrounds, maybe drug lifestyle, uh, just just running away lifestyle, uh, whatever you want to call it. They came to Christ and they said, forgive me of my past, right? And they saw it from that standpoint because there was a lot of shame they had. But I noticed this uh, very across the board, everywhere, there was a deep struggle in talking about it. And when it would get brought up, they would say, it's under the blood, it's under the blood, it's under the blood. But shame was still on them. It wasn't allowing them to go, yeah, yeah, that happened. God's done a real work in my life, but that's what happened. It makes us afraid of our story, so we lock it in the past. And then it kind of haunts us in the background because we're not letting it be put into perspective because we're avoiding And we're like, oh, and then we feel guilty. Oh, if people knew about this in my past. Not that you have to go announce it to everyone or, or, you know, back up the truck to everybody you talk to and just dump all the, you know, the history of what you've been through. It's, it's this, I'm talking about the inner work is humbly, because when I'm not humble, I get out of sobriety and I start defending myself and I'm panicking, right? When I enter into humility, I sober up and I let love have a work. So now instead of running from my past, I embrace it. And I accept, this is going back to the question here. This is part of your letting go. I, you accept that you can't fix that moment. Now, are there times we can go back and say, we're sorry? Yes. But even many times people with shame, they overdo that. They're over-apologizing. They're over, and they're still struggling, right? We need to make amends to those that we've truly hurt. Yes, that's, that's an important part of the process. But we cannot go and redo it, edit it, or just like somehow... Make it disappear. It happened. And a part of our healing is actually acceptance. Now, in learning to practice acceptance, we have to see our past from the lens of learning. All of life is learning. It's not about failure. Failure is not the end. Just when you thought you're at your worst and it's the end, it's not about that. It's about learning. Your past is actually informative. And many people they struggle in their growth because they don't know how to process their past in a meaningful and fruitful way. They're always being accused. It's like an indictment against them all the time because they haven't allowed learning. Grace sees all your life as learning. Yeah, but I did this. Yep. God's here. He's working. He'll use you. And he's, he's, he's healing. Don't run from it. Don't shove it away. Don't say it's just under the blood, but you don't want to talk about it, never want to deal with it, because that that can be valuable. Your history can be valuable in learning how to heal and grow, to hand the baton off to the next generation, because you've worked through the trenches of stuff in your life, and you give that to them. Now, a big factor we have to confront is we have to let go of our control issues. What we typically do in the past is we have ways of controlling it. We control how other people talk about it. We control our image. We control in our thoughts. Don't go there. We put it in a box. We we have certain rituals we get into. These are all control mechanisms that are rooted in fear. Show me your fears, and I will see the control issues that manifest out of it. And so, Instead of running in avoidance, we have to face the fear. What does the fear say? Well, if they know this, if they know that, people see this, you'll be unloved, you'll be rejected. So the control feeds the avoidance. But what it keeps you from doing, control keeps you avoiding where you're off over here. Going, maybe I need to repent another 32 times, or maybe I need to do this, or maybe this I need to do, or maybe I need to spin and spin. We go back to the spin cycle, right? That's a form of avoidance. It doesn't let us face the fear. 
And many times what we actually need to do about our past is let ourselves grieve. Because it's not about it all being your fault, you being a worthless person, a terrible person. There's actually some grieving there. Your younger self, your past self, and just things that you didn't understand, you weren't aware of, brokenness and and, and unaddressed issues in your life that haven't been healed to allow you to grieve. Where grieving leads us, mourning loss and just working through disappointments, it leads us to acceptance. They even say the, the grieving process. You go through, you know, the bargaining, the denial, the bargaining, right? The anger, the depression, and then acceptance. Acceptance doesn't say sin's okay. We, we, we sometimes get mixed up in that, right? Like we're saying sin is good. No, acceptance recognizes, okay, this is, this is what happened. I see it. And you see it in perspective as a part of your journey versus trying to fix it, change it, or manipulate it in some way to make it, I don't know, look in some way where you can control how people see you. So to get to the question now, took a little bit of the longer route because it sparked this as I was looking at this question. When people say let go, yes, it can be dismissive because they they want you to go here with all, all the foundational work I just said. The new relationship with yourself, the working through how you see things, right? We often give these, just let it go, just let it go. Most people don't have an let it go muscle developed. That's a muscle that has to be developed. So when you're letting go, here's here's one way I could I could state it. Um, part of it is letting go of our control issues, right? Because control is a way that, listen, control is a way we avoid the uncomfortable feelings that rise up about our past. And part of letting go is letting go of that. I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to actually feel the feelings when it rises up. And each time I'm going to practice compassionate grace. Here it comes again. And it's like a roller coaster. Right, you ride the roller coaster. Eventually, the roller coaster ends, but it was a rough ride. Depending on if you like roller coasters or not, I'm not a big fan. But I'll go through it. Oh, okay, it's over. My stomach's a little queasy, but I know it's going to end. And these shame attacks, these uprisings of your past, they will end, and you go, "Well, it's going to come back." Yep. And the next time it comes back, you're going to practice being more loving again. And each time, it's like water that washes over the rocks. It starts to like refine them. It pushes over the sand, and the first wave doesn't change everything. But wave after wave, and this is what the love of and the grace of God does, wave after wave. So the past moment rises up, and you go, no, wait, I need to look at this lovingly. I don't know that I can. <laughs> Came through again. All right, it's all right. I'm keep practicing compassion because then I can see it for what it is and I allow God to have a work now in my life. So letting go is involves renewing your view of the past. That takes practice. And it's it's letting go of the shame and unloving ways you see the past. So each time around, you nope, nope, I'm not gonna shame on myself. Nope. Not going to do that. Oh, I'm going into editing. I'm spinning in the ruminating. And you realize this ruminating is actually anti-loving. When I ruminate, it's like I'm taking the knife and I'm just shoving it further in. I'm not letting love have its work. And I realize when I'm practicing ruminating about the past, I am just hammering myself in an unproductive, unfruitful way. And Letting go is accepting. Letting go of the control issues, the unloving ways, right? And I'm accepting the past as a part of my journey. Now, your past isn't who you are, right? Your past isn't who you are, but it's a part of the package of your journey. Let it be something that God takes and uses as a part of your learning and as a part of your growing. So as you practice this, my counsel to you is... Gently, take steps forward. Gently take steps forward. Keep walking forward. You're not hurrying and running forward, avoiding. No. But we're not staying in the past. We're allowing new moments of renewal. Because if I made some mistakes... 
and I let it be learning, it's going to be informative for now. If you made a mistake in relationships in the past, it lets you learn. So now in my relationships, I'm learning. And boy, the pain of that, as I'm working through it, it makes me lovingly aware of where I am now to begin move forward. Now, when you're driving in a car, the rear view mirror is helpful to be aware of things in the past, but you don't drive staring at the rear view mirror. It needs to be put in its proper place. Ruminating shifts the rear view mirror with the front uh, windshield. And we need to switch that back. I need to see the windshield moving forward, but I allowed the rear view to be informative and helpful for my journey. So I pray this helps get you out of rumination and get you to being present in the moment because you're loved and put these things in the past in its proper context. Is this helpful for you? Let me know right in the comments and let me know what was helpful. Please like and subscribe. Be sure to uh, share this and subscribe to our email newsletter, mark at uh, markdehesus.com. You can go there and I'll give you updates on future resources and materials, upcoming books, and all of that that's available. If you'd like to support these videos, you can give a one-time donation or become a regular supporter. If you want a next-level application of this, I would recommend the book, God Loves Me and I Love Myself. This will be a helpful place to park to allow you to see yourself in a renewed way so that you can allow this renewed work and how you relate to your thoughts and even your history in a more fruitful way. So, Lord willing and the creek don't rise, this is your brother from another mother saying, I'm out, but I look forward to bringing new insights for your healing and freedom journey. God bless you. See you next time. Yeah.